Hey guys, welcome to the second ever Paznia Segralm Assembly, hosted live here in the Paznia Committee of Correspondence Telegram, the official chat of the Free Republic. Keep up to date with happenings, just visit t.me forward slash Paznia chat. For the purposes of transparency and inclusion, this will also be recorded and released on the various Bonnie podcast feeds. But obviously, Telegram is totally public, so as always, please do keep relevant security culture and privacy concerns in mind. Regardless, thank you so much for being here today. This discussion was sparked by the most recent release, TVP number 171, titled Community as an Essence with Rex. A Rex's Paznia-esque project, vision, philosophies, and ideas spark further discussion in this chat, uh, which brings us all here today. If you haven't already, make sure to check that episode out. It's at bonniepodcast.com forward slash 171, or you can find it on Fascist Tube or Odyssey. So I'm going to introduce Paznia real quick for those who may be new. The Free Republic of Paznia, P-A-Z, stands for Permanent Autonomous Zones, which are essentially just pockets of freedom where we can you know, be free and have our autonomy. So the idea of Paznia is a decentralized network of these permanent autonomous zones, uh, whether they're self-sufficient homesteads, safe places for people to city park in a van, and maybe a, a self-sustainable greenhouse, like uh, what Rex is talking about. Places where we can you know, be free and have our autonomy, that's the, that's the idea. At Current, uh, we just started putting together the map and the directory, which is only for vetted Paznians. You gotta know who you work with. That's one way to forego a lot of conflict and coercion in the future. For more information, just visit Paznia.com. There's a lot of stuff on there. Paznia.com is a place to go. I'm just gonna go ahead and jump in and introduce myself. Um, I'm Buller. I'm also a Paznian here at Paznia, and I'm a member of the Department of Energy and the Department of Health and Wellness. So one of the things that I've been focusing on recently when it comes to energy and power independence and things like that is alternative energy sources. We've actually been using in the Department of Health and Wellness here a Browns gas generator, and we've been uh, breathing the Browns gas and drinking it uh, infused in water. It's a very good antioxidant and antacid. It's basically a good electron donor. Not only that, the gases are combustible, and the electrolysis is efficient enough that when combusted, it can provide a net gain in energy. So we're looking at maybe harnessing that with a generator at some point and or finding someone who knows automotive so that we can start to install some of these um, little kits that they've had for a while. George Wiseman, I don't know if you've heard of him, in the 90s, he started selling like automotive you conversions see. and things. You are talking about electrolysis of water. You would have like a certain acoustic frequency at the same time as your electrolysis, I guess it makes it more efficient. So I don't know what the yeah. frequency cavitation, is. Cavitation, I think, I think is what that's it's called. What the original. Is that cavitation? Yeah, whatever that, the original, I think, was something about that, where that's how you get Yeah, the there's game. various ways to improve the efficiency of the electrolysis of water. And um, cavitation is one of the processes that can be stimulated through various means. Sometimes if the plates are close enough together, you can have sort of like an arc discharge, which can kind of start the cavitation process. But yes, you can also have like pulse width modulation and sound frequencies. I don't know specifically what those frequencies are, but there's various ways that you can increase the efficiency of the electrolysis of water. Yeah, I'm really excited about all that stuff and want to start some of these projects over the long term. However, we do need someone who's good enough with automotive. You might have to bypass some sensors and change the timing electronically if you're going to work on converting cars. But I've been looking at some electricity generators that... It looked very simple. There was a guy who built one out of two by fours and a few stainless steel plates. So I'm going to look at maybe putting that together, hopefully in the next year. I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Bueller. These fuel saver kits can be installed. We're transitioning over to off-grid, but we've got a propane tank now, which is better for most stuff here. So instead of being reliant 100% of the time, we only aim to come out like once a year. These kits that can be installed on cars or whatever can also be installed in propane tanks. It's pretty incredible stuff. Bueller and I have been going down a lot of those rabbit holes, and it's been a lot of fun. And on that note, I guess I should mention, I, I think I've, I've mentioned it in maybe one, or I guess one guest appearance, possibly, but January here on the Bonnie Podcast. Um, Breakthrough Energy Month, going to have Sky Huddleston back on, probably hopefully go deeper into the Bork engine, now that I have a little better idea, but I'll hopefully have a little more time to do some more research on that. His uh, Liberator rocket heater with coming Tesla turbine, which is amazing. Not the only Tesla turbine that's coming out in the market this next year, by the way, apparently. But there's a lot of really awesome stuff in the works. Another person I'll be having on is Bernie. I found him a couple of years ago doing monoatomic experiments on YouTube. And he's been doing interviews with Nancy and John Hutchison on, I guess, crystal battery cells. And the prospects with those are absolutely uh, amazing, but I'll kind of leave it there for now because we'll hopefully talk about that next month. But uh, Bueller, do you have anything else you want to add on any of these items? Well, I'm glad you brought up uh, Bernie and the Hutchinsons and uh, the crystal battery tech because that's something else I want to add to the list for this next year. Uh, battery technology should be way better than it is. We're going to 
see what we can do to mix up some very good power storage for a really long-term power storage. Like where some of these batteries could last years without ever needing charged. So I'm really interested in, in that as well. So I've got two things that are also energy related. One is thermal battery and the, the other one I'm going to talk about first. But this idea that everything is recyclable, I didn't really get that idea until Recently, maybe a few months back, I heard someone on the radio or something say that the hotter something burns, the more bonds break. And then it made me think back to chemistry and what heat is. And atoms, when they heat up, they shake. So the more they shake, the more likely they are to break apart and just separate. So you have a long hydrocarbon chain that is some plastic or something. When you burn it at a low heat, you could burn plastic in a campfire, but the heat isn't very high. So when that plastic turns to a gas, it gasifies, it dries, these are all similar terms here, but it basically burns, then the exhaust that's coming up out of the fire, you'll see a bunch of black smoke and it's longer chains of hydrocarbons because it's still not broken apart enough. Whereas if you heat it a lot more, you break it down into smaller pieces. And when you get your hydrocarbons broken into very small pieces, I mean, if, if it's hot enough, then you break it completely <laughs> apart. So you got hydrogen and carbon separated. But even before that heat level, you get smaller molecules. Because you heated it up higher, you get smaller molecules. Now, if you do that, you can gasify pretty much anything on the periodic table. In college, we were plating with aluminum. We would have aluminum in a crucible, and it would heat it up so much that it would start putting off aluminum particles into the air because you were turning it to a gas. And then we had an electric plate that we were trying to coat with aluminum. So then we would apply some electricity to attract that. But basically, even aluminum, even any metal can turn into a gas. And what happens if you turn something into a gas and then you condense it, just like you're familiar with water, it can turn into vapor and then it can condense. Well, different materials condense at different pressures and temperatures. So if you had a long line, you could take the landfill of trash and you could grind it up into small pieces and then you could put it into a um, like a conveyor process and then heat it up. And as you're heating it, then you're taking the gas and you can recondense it at different temperatures and pressures and then it will drip out into different buckets and you'll get gold in one of those buckets. You'll get silver in another one of those buckets. You'll get water. You'll get usable fuel. So this is where it comes to energy, because there's actually quite a bit of usable fuel in trash if we were to want to convert it back to gasoline that we can put in a car. And also it helps to run the process so you don't have to only rely on a solar concentrator and a bunch of mirrors to heat up your trash. You can take some of the output that you get, and instead of putting it in your car, you can run it through a jet engine or some flame and heat up the trash so that you can heat it up more. So that is a concept that I believe was not in my mind when I grew up from the indoctrination was like, hey, this isn't recyclable. But now my current belief is that everything is recyclable because everything can be turned into a gas with enough heat and it can be recondensed. So that's one thing. Everything is recyclable. The plan for the setup for my greenhouse setup is we're going to have two wells instead of one water well, and we're going to use one of the water wells in the summer. We're going to pull cold water out of that aquifer, and then it's going to be warm. We're going to heat it up even more and inject it into the ground to heat up the ground near a different side of the place. So you're going to have one side, and then the other side of the property is going to have the other well, and you're going to cycle it one direction during one season, and then in the other season, you're going to cycle it the other way. So in the winter, you're going to take that warm water and you're going to be able to use it as warmer water because all of the earth, all of the dirt got heated up during the summer because we pumped in super hot water that we heated up with solar concentrators or whatever other method we choose. So we're using that earth as a battery and we could dig down and insulate around that battery and fill it with molten salt, but also we might be able to, I haven't tested yet, but we might be able to get away with just simply injecting hot water into the ground on one side and have that ground get warm and then pull the water back out during the winter time. And in the winter time, 
you're going to do the opposite thing. You're going to pre-cool your water, get it very, very cold before putting it down into the ground. And you virtually have an unlimited size of battery. It's like you can fit tons of joules of energy or therm in that, uh, that, that setup. So you're only relying then on solar power to run the pump. That's actually quite interesting about recycling materials, especially hydrocarbons, because that reminds me again of the Hutchesons. They use some sort of ultrasonic catalyst when it comes to breaking hydrocarbons down into the water and carbon dioxide and stuff. And they've actually used it on uh, like oil slicks in the Gulf to help clean up the oil spill. But then John Hutchison also uses electromagnetic waves to sort of like recycle metallic elements, especially unstable isotopes into more stable ones so that they're not radioactive. There's definitely something there when it comes to recycling materials and turning one thing into another and using sound and electromagnetic waves to do that. Another thing that you mentioned also reminded me of electroculture, which is another project we want to try to get into this year. Because when you're gardening, you can, I guess, plant these conductive materials that can act like a conduit for Earth's natural electric and magnetic potentials and somehow impart that to the plants, and it has quite an effect. So I've heard we're going to experiment with that this spring, too. Yeah, just uh, go on YouTube and type in electroculture. There's this uh, guy who's out in, like, Sweden or something, and, like, I guess that was his, his college degree was electroculture. And you'll see some of the pictures. He had a sunflower that was just, like, huge. Like, I've never seen a sunflower that big. So apparently it's super effective and it's, it's common over there. So we're going to yeah, experiment with it and see what happens.